Good afternoon, and thank you for being here, taking your very precious time uh, to listen to me. How many of you were here before? Okay, and how many of you watched the video? So most of you. How many of you have not seen the earlier video? Okay, so I'm going to try to... Um, uh, they're connected, obviously. The first set of... The first video was on why should you even care about fostering your own enterprise, my enterprise incorporated. And uh, it was really about four questions that you should be asking yourself because the questions are critical to you thinking about what it is that you want to be, right? And those four questions were, what's my mission or purpose? What does success look like to me? What is my value proposition? And then with whom should I trade? So if you haven't already watched it, I would highly encourage you to do that because that kind of sets the stage for this particular uh, video or um, uh, talk and also because they're very, very connected together. So today what I'd like to do though is assuming that you've had some time to reflect on what are the answers to those four questions and I'll talk about the framework that kind of brings it all together. Uh, then what do you do next? Because those are the, your why, if you will. Why should you be thinking about your mission, right? How should you be thinking about that? But then the next step is, okay, fine, I've got these answers, but then how do I get there? How do I get to my mission? And how do I know that I've been successful? What do I need to do to be successful? What do I need to do to claim the value proposition that I want to establish for myself? So this talk is much more about the how, which is why it's called the strategy for me incorporated, or what I would like to say strategic you. Now, what I'd like to do is, of course, make this very interactive. So please, if you have any questions, raise your hand, ask me. We'll try and leave a little bit of time for Q&A too, but I'm going to be very respectful of the fact that we need to be out of here at 2 p.m. And I'll be more than happy, Kim, to come back for just a regular Q&A if you guys believe that it's of value. Okay, so the, uh, the, last, session, the last talk on how to be the CEO of Me Incorporated really ended with what I call the trader Sudoku, right? So Sudoku has nine parts to it. So also can a trader Sudoku. And the nine parts, just to refresh, is you or me, which is the one constant in your world. The next fundamental choice you should make about your world being the places you go, the things you do, and the people you meet. So especially as it relates to the people you meet, who are the people you want to have in your life? So who's the you, whether it's professionally or personally, that you want to be interacting with? Right? And often we think in trade as what am I doing and what are you doing? But really, if we go through those four questions approach, the fundamental issue that you have to ask before you even say what am I doing and what are you doing is what are we trying to accomplish together? And how does it fit in my aspirations? And how does it fit in your aspirations? And then what are my complementary capabilities? What do I bring to the table? And what do you bring to the table? Okay. So any questions, thoughts before we dive into assuming this as the background? Now how do we get there? We're good? OK. So then today what I'd like to do is, again, just like I'm using strategy and entrepreneurship concepts to define you being the CEO of Me Incorporated, I'm going to use a very particular strategic concept called SWOT analysis. How many of you have heard of SWOT before? OK, a big chunk. So that's good, right? So we're going to talk about how can you conduct SWOT on yourself. Um, and then we're going to talk about the strategic initiatives matrix, which I call the tools matrix. Notice it's SWOT tools, same letters involved, um, but there's a reason why we call them the tools matrix. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you develop the brand called you, which is, of course, what is your value proposition. Okay? Um, so SWOT analysis is something that we use in strategy when we're doing a deep dive analysis of an organization in the context of its environment. So you could think about the University um, of Maryland Medical School 
as being the organization, correct? Within the greater area of Baltimore, or you can think about the environment being medicine, generally speaking, right? Both in the United States or at world at large. So generally speaking, research has shown that the most successful strategies address four aspects of the organization and the setting within which it operates. So these are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive in that you can think about strengths and weaknesses of the organization and you can think about the opportunities and threats of the environment within which the organization is. So notice why I say it's mutually exclusive but collectively exhaustive. It's either the organization or the environment. So inside versus outside. And it's either challenges or opportunities, right? So the negatives versus the positives or strengths versus weaknesses. Right? So together they kind of cover the gamut of things that you should be thinking about. Now SWOT is a very useful framework for organizing the questions one should ask about a firm strategy. So let me ask you this, how many of you have done SWOT analysis in addition to being familiar with the concept? Okay, now be honest, how many of you thought that the SWOT analysis was truly useful too? <laughs> now I'm getting kind of sorta yes, no. What was not useful about SWOT? Yes. I guess when I um, first tried doing SWOT analysis, I wasn't, I didn't know uh, what weaknesses were, and so I didn't know how to make a good SWOT analysis. Okay, so part of it is of course in the application of the tool, but let's say that you've applied it really, really well and been true to the concept, so you've nailed down what you believe are the strengths and weaknesses of the organizations and the opportunities and threats. You don't know what to do after it. You don't know what to do after it. Okay, fine, so I've got the answers to the questions, now what? So one of the things that I often find with uh, my own mentees, as well as the executives that I teach in the executive MBA program, of which Kim is great, is Kim did not just sit there and do the SWOT analysis. Right? Yes, she did, but she said, okay, I want to create a strategy. What's next? What do I do with all of this data that I have just gathered? Right? Which is one of the reasons why she asked me to come and talk to you as it relates to WIMS. Right? So creating a strategic direction, whether it's for WIMS, and of course, more importantly, whether it's for you, starts off with conducting the SWOT analysis because you now have the answers to your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you now have a whole list of these things. And I'll talk about how you can make more effective versus less effective lists in just a second. But then you need to create strategies and the best way to do it is to start matching them to each other. Right? So you can match your strengths and weaknesses to the organizational environmental opportunities and threats to. You can do it at an organizational level, an initiative level, or as I'm gonna be talking about today, at a very personal level for yourself. What you wanna do is determine the best fit of the opportunities that exist elsewhere and the resources that you have internally. And the notion here is to really focusing on maximizing the added value. Not to do everything, but to prioritize those strategies that are going to add more impact versus less impact. Okay? And so then you can make recommendations for positioning and strategic initiatives. So let me just lay out the framework of the twos matrix in addition to the SWOT. So as opposed to creating a laundry list, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and then making them linear notes, what I would recommend is that you create a matrix. So you start off with listing strengths and weaknesses as columns. And then you put in the opportunities and threats as rows. That itself will allow you then to create strategies right off the bat. 
Yes? I, yes, I love low-hanging fruits. You love <laughs> low-hanging fruits. Okay, so let's talk about what these strategies mean. So strategies that you can create. Does, do you see how this answers your question of what do I do next? Well, if I match a strength to an opportunity that exists in the external environment, right? Right there, I have a low-hanging fruit, right? I was Kim's low-hanging fruit, <laughs> right? I was in her environment as her executive MBA strategy professor, right? And Kim herself had the strengths of being outgoing, being um, very mission-oriented, right? Yes? True story. True story, right? <laughs> so as soon as I talked about these concepts, she utilized her strengths, her quick thinking, mission-oriented framework and said, Rashri, would you come and give us a talk on these issues, right? So that's an example of a low-hanging fruit, right? You match your strengths to the opportunities. The S, W, O strategies, where you match your weaknesses to the opportunities is what I call patching the bucket strategy. You know that you have to offset a particular weakness, but rather than doing it yourself, and then just bemoaning the fact that you have a weakness, figure out what is an opportunity that you can leverage that patches the bucket, if you will. So in an organizational framework, very often when you see firms, rather than building a resource to address a new, um, uh, you know, an issue that they're facing, they tend to acquire other companies. Right? That would be an example of a WO strategy. We don't have these capabilities in-house, and we don't have the time to develop these capabilities in-house. So let's go ahead and acquire a company that is going to be able to give us that information. Right? For a personal level, a WO strategy would be where you partner with someone. So we were talking earlier about the fact that let's say you want to do research on a particular issue. I do this all the time in terms of my research growth, if you will. Every time that I come up with a particular research question, which requires me to go into a methodology or a theoretical lens that I'm not familiar with, and particularly for methodology, what I end up doing is saying, how, who can I identify who is the best at this methodology? And then convince them to partner with me so that I don't have to learn the methodology from scratch, but I can partner and we can co-author together because I can provide value to them in alternative ways that make it sense, right? So that would be a WO patching the bucket strategy. ST strategies, for obvious reasons, also make sense. They're stepping forward in as much as there are threats in the environment and you are addressing it by putting your best foot forward, your strengths. Yes, And then finally, I call these grand challenges because these are the ones that in fact require you to create a strategy that at the same time negates a weakness and neutralizes a threat. Right? Now, generally speaking, you're not going to have many strategies here. But the strategies that you do have here are truly transformational. Right? So when we talk about disruptive technologies or disruptive innovation, they tend to come in this because you're literally reinventing the box. You're thinking about what is it that you're going to transform within yourself and at the same time negate a threat. Okay. So far so good? Yes. By the way, we're going to have these slides available as well as the video available so you don't have to worry about taking copious notes. Um, uh, we can make that available. So to, to just put in words what I have just talked through, right? this would be the slide set that will allow you to create these strategies for yourselves. Okay? Now, this, this talk is not so much about an organization as much as about yourself. So how do you develop your own tools matrix? Right? It goes to the first topic or the first thing to do is do a good SWOT analysis. Right? So when you conduct SWOT analysis on yourself, some tips and tricks that would help. First off, know that this can be very hard. And of course, it requires a lot of objectivity. 
So, and one of the things that I realized that often, because it's hard and because it requires objectivity, what is the first thing that we tend to do when something is hard? Put it off, procrastinate, right? I'll talk a little bit later about what you can do to create accountability for yourselves, right? So that you're not procrastinating. But you have to use this as in, this is difficult, but it is important. And indeed, if I procrastinate, it may be that I'm going to be repeating the same ineffective strategies over and over again. So I need to commit to this activity as being important because, in fact, it may help me in the long run because I'm not spending so much time always reinventing and doing the same mistakes over and over. Right? So first and foremost, it can be hard, requires a lot of objectivity, so make the commitment to do it. Now, importantly, and this gets to potentially your point about, you know, how do I know whether it's a strength or a weakness, right? Now, that can be hard. In fact, sometimes the same characteristic can be a strength or a weakness, opportunity or a threat. Framing matters, right? So let me give you a personal example. I tend to say I'm assertive. My husband will tell you I'm pushy. <laughs> right? Now, the big issue out here is I can sometimes say it and dismiss it by saying, well, you say I'm pushy because I'm pushing against you for something that I want as opposed to what you want. Right? But then it also behooves me to say, wait a minute, when is it that my assertiveness is being interpreted by the other person as pushiness, in which case I'm actually derailing my own purpose. So being cognizant of the fact that you should be assertive, and particularly for us women, this is an issue that we worry about quite a bit, right? Am, are we being construed as being pushy? And then I can, of course, use a lot of other adjectives that you may or may not have heard of, right? But this is where rather than saying, oh my gosh, I'm being concerned like this, and then immediately retract, spend the time to think about what about your behavior is absolutely appropriate, and you should stand firm ground. It is a strength, and embrace it. And what about it is truly a weakness, in which case you also need to address that. So that is first off, so that I just gave you an example of a strength and a weakness, right? You could think about the same thing as an opportunity or a threat. So one of the issues that often comes up is technology. Is technology an opportunity or is it a threat? If the answer is yes, then you have not gone deep enough. So then the follow-up question should be, what about technology makes it an opportunity? What about technology makes it a threat? And then go that one level down. Right? Have you seen hidden figures, by the way? But, you know, I love movies. That's what I do in the evening when I'm burnt out and stuff. Hidden figures is a really, really inspirational uh, movie. And in part, it's because it was, of course, I'm a science nerd, too, at heart. But when I, when I watch this movie, there is this room, and it's uh, titled computers, right? When we think computers, what do we think of? Laptops, machines, right? No. Computers circa 1950s, right, F 50s, which is when they were thinking about the Apollo mission and so on, were humans, right? And they were designated as computers, correct? Now, the person that was in charge supervising the computers, human computers, was confronted with the fact that there is now this machine, the IBM big mainframe computer. But when they installed it in NASA, this machine is just lying idle because they haven't figured out how to use it. So she could think about the computer as a threat. Correct? This is going to, and she was told that. In fact, that's how it was framed. You guys, this computer unit, it's going to go away because what we're going to be using is this mainframe. On the other hand, she said, 
well, if this computer is going to replace me, somebody's got to use it. Might as well be me. So then she goes ahead and buys or steals, rather, a Fortran book from a library right, and educates herself. So now she has taken it and made it not a threat, but an opportunity. Correct? So again, framing matters. And you go that one level deep, deeper down. What about it makes it a threat? What about it makes it an opportunity? And that's what you list in your matrix. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. OK. And then it's also important to think through both soft skills and hard skills. Often I find that when my executives are using this framework, they either focus on their personality characteristics or they focus on their education, their experience. Both matter. So you want to make sure that you're using a combination of the two when you're thinking about your strengths and weaknesses too. Right? Now, just like I said, I talk to my husband quite a bit. He is my best friend and, in fact, a very, very sound advisor in my life. Right? You want to consult your family and friends, but you want to weigh their input judiciously. Right? So as I said to you before, I have to think about when is it that my husband is truly advising me, or is it an issue that is now creating conflict between us, and that's what he's reacting from. Right? So that's what I mean when I say you want to weigh their input judiciously. And I'll also talk a little bit later, if we have time, about how do you choose who among your family and friends do you talk to to get this external advice? Because it's a good gut check. And indeed, very often in my strengths and weaknesses matrix, there have been strengths that I was completely oblivious about. That it was a very good friend of mine that then pointed to me that that was an issue that I didn't even think about as an active one. And then once he pointed that to me, I then became actively engaged in utilizing that in my future strategies. Now, here is another tip that will be very helpful as you're thinking about creating a SWOT. Start with a laundry list in all four categories. In fact, when I give worksheets out, I tell people to list 10 strengths about themselves, 10 weaknesses, 10 opportunities, and 10 threats. And then I say, narrow it down to top two or three. Prioritize. Now you might say, why am I making work for you? If all I care about is just two or three, then why am I making you write 10? How might you respond? Yes, Rosemary. Well, I would think that you would start out by kind of listing the easy ones, but those might not be the most important ones. OK. Very good. So listing 10 allows you to be more holistic. You start off with rush writing, whatever comes in the top of your mind. But then as you're writing, there might be others that you ponder about and then start to put down on paper. That's one very good reason to have a longer list. You can group a lot of them into an overarching, broader category. Excellent, right? Then you see patterns emerging across the 10 items that you have listed. And you say, you know, this is really consistent with one bigger concept. And they're all manifestations of the same underlying strength. Or they're reflective of the same underlying weakness. Yes? So that's the second reason why you want to start with a bigger list. And then group. So prior identifying the more difficult ones or the more important ones from the ones that are less, grouping them. Those are two excellent reasons why you want to start with a laundry list and then consolidate. What else might be another important reason? Bless you. Anything else comes to mind? For me, it reduces the cognitive burden, right? If I'm just focused on writing, and identifying, I don't have to worry about prioritizing at the same time. right? I just rush right, don't think about whether it's important or not. So I break that same task into two different steps. right? Just identify first, and then reflect, which is exactly what these three elements will do. 
right? Because you just write them down. Then you begin your second reflection. You say, is it important? Is it easier versus more difficult? Are there groups that I can create out of it, right? What else is missing? That's when your cognitive aspects kick in. And so then you can go ahead and revisit this list as often as you need, right? So that's why I find it very helpful to do that. And of course, I'm iterating across each of these bullet points as opposed to making it linear as I'm thinking through this. And that then allows me to create this tools matrix, which allows me to create my strategic direction. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So this then allows you to map out your specific objectives and strategies. By the way, when you're creating those, one second, right? When you're generating strategies, what is a strategy? Fundamentally, what's a strategy? It's an action, right? So start with an action verb. Create an entire sentence, not just subsets of it, right? So can I pick on you, Kim? Sure. Okay. So what might you say beyond what I've already observed as your strength, right? What is a strength that you believe is important for you? Uh, very fast processing power. Okay. Fast thinker. Yes? OK, what's an opportunity that you could potentially map with fast thinking? I mean, I'm kind of doing it right now, which is taking a whole other degree on top of what I'm doing. OK, so your opportunity is an executive MBA from University of Maryland, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, how might you generate a strategy that would match your fast thinking capabilities? with an executive MBA? Uh, I mean, in terms of just doing it? Yeah, so just, a, just an action. An action is a, well, lead all the teams at once. <laughs> My executive MBA is basically how it seems to be going right now. OK, very good. So we could change this from fast thinking to leadership characteristics, right? Right? OK. So whether it's fast thinking, innovative leadership, whatever it is that you want, right? Whatever it is that you have uh, put up here, right? You can say, utilize, that's your action verb, right? My leadership or my fast thinking, innovative thinking, and the concepts I learn in my executive MBA, right, to create new or lead new initiatives such as WIMS. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Right? What have I done here? I've created an action plan. Right? A sentence always has a subject and a predicate. Correct? Joined by a verb. The nuns that taught me English would be so happy right now with me. <laughs> right? Right? So this is the action, right? The subjects are innovative thinking and concepts in the EMBA program. Agree? And the predicate is, what am I going to do with it? And that's a strategy. So you see, the reason why I say you only want two or three in each box is if you have two strengths and two opportunities, how many strategies can you generate in the SO strategy box alone? Four, right? Four plus four plus four plus four. I'm bad at math. That's my weakness. How much is that? 
16 is already way too many, right? Because no more than five or six for you to be effective in any time. So once you create these 16 strategies, so that's why prioritization is so important. Once you create the 16 strategies, again, they become your laundry list. What do you do with it? Prioritize. Prioritize. Look at similarities. Create themes that then make it even narrower. Because you're not going to be able to keep 16 strategies in mind. But if you can create themes that connect many of these strategies, then you are down to maybe three or four themes, that they all come together. You can recognize contradictions. If I do this, then I cannot do this. You'll often find that happening too. That's again a time for you to say, OK, which one should I do as opposed to not? Then you look at which one of them is more consistent with the other strategies. And that helps you resolve a potential contradiction. Is this helpful? Okay. And that's basically how you utilize your tools matrix. Okay. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit more about the brand called you. Have you heard about that phrase too? Okay. So let me go ahead and talk about that, right? So what's that? Soup. What kind of soup? Campbell's tomato soup. Right? Generally speaking, we know this. Brand name product, yes? Serves the critical factor of taste. Agreed? About 89 cents the last time I looked. Yes? How many of you buy Campbell's soup when you go grocery shopping? I do. It goes great. My niece teases me about the fact that you can't make Indian chicken with soup. Not true. Make darn good Indian spicy chicken <laughs> with soup as the main ingredient. Right? OK. What's that? Soup again. Yes? And I'm just going to focus on the first one, the classic tomato. What's the difference? OK. So this one is Campbell's tomato soup at hand. Notice the branding at hand. What's important there? So is it a brand name product? Same brand name. And saves, serves the same critical feature of taste, right? It's the exact same soup. What is the value proposition beyond this critical function? Individual servings, convenience, portability, microwavability, right? So it has the additional element of convenience. Price, $1.75, right? You pay for convenience, right? And there are some times that it makes sense. So now you've got choices. Right? If you know that you're going to be cooking with it at home as part of a recipe, then you're going to buy this one. If you know you're going to use it for lunch, then you're going to say this is more convenient. Agreed? That's what we mean by value proposition. What are the features that are different, and what is the benefit that these features provide you? That's all there is when we think about brand and when we think about value proposition. So what is a personal brand similar to Coca-Cola, to Campbell's? A brand adds dimensions to a product or a service that connotates a certain image in your potential consumers, right? And it separates you from other products and services that are designed to satisfy the same element. So it's Coca-Cola versus, let's say, a no-name brand. Right? Similarly, a personal brand highlights a person's special qualifications to fulfill a role so that others may seek them to fulfill that role. Right? 
So how do you, here's a Dilbert cartoon that I found pretty um, fascinating. I researched your personal brand online. My what? I looked at your blog, your tweets, and your Facebook page. I Googled your name and followed every link. I checked your credit card, your criminal record, school transcripts, and references. And that's just the external stuff. That's right. It's my attitude that counts. No, I mean I have the results of your urine test. <laughs> and apparently some of your sample landed in the DNA test kit. And that tanning bed you used last night was actually an MRI. How's your attitude now? Much harder to fake. Right? Now, I use this with my high school students to remind them that they need to start thinking about what they post online about their public image, because that's very important as your value proposition. Right? But more seriously, of course, this requires us to think about ourselves as a brand. We portray something. We stand for something. And in fact, what we should be standing for are our values. Right? Those answers to those four, four questions. What's my purpose? What does success look like? What's my value proposition? And with whom do I trade? Those are all representative in your personal brand. Who you are. What your identity is. Is that the same as your image? So going back to that third question, what's my value proposition? If you remember, we talked about what are your features and how does it benefit the customer? And in that particular talk, I had said that what you really want to be is in this quadrant where you're thought of as indispensable for a particular talk, topic, for a particular task, as a team member, as the person that's providing you, um, the, the customer, a unique and beneficial service. So steps for developing your brand. Define your aspirations. That's what, you, what does success look like. And then also define your audience. So in your world of opportunities and threats, your environment that's out there, who are your focal audience members? By offering a point of difference. Here it is, the concepts that I've learned, as well as my innovative thinking. right? Relative to others, and they can be others that would want to take this position, or others that need to complement you and help you out here, right? So who are my frame of reference? What are my capabilities that are complementary to the others? So when you've created your board, that also becomes your frame of reference because they're not people that you're competing with, but you're collaborating with as well, right? And I'm gonna do this in addition to the expected, what is required of me, right? Which in your case would be? Internal programming, business as usual, as it relates to your faculty obligations, for instance. Yes? OK. So how do you select your frame of reference? Your frame of reference is what I call the pond that you choose to swim in. Right? For me, it is the strategy and entrepreneurship research community and the business leaders and executives such as yourself that I want to interact with. Right? That's my pond or that I choose to swim in. Right? So it relates to both your competitors and to the audience that you seek to reach. It can be as broad or as narrow as you choose to define it. And of course, that's also going to vary across your career life cycle. Right? So my pond in which I chose to swim in as an assistant professor was very much the academic research community. Originally, it was in economics because that's where I spent my first six years. Then I moved into a business school and I expanded it or changed it to strategy and entrepreneurship while still utilizing my economics degree. Now that I'm the director of the Snyder uh, Center as well as an endowed professor, for me, the pond is making external impact. Right? I feel like I'm quite established in my academic level, but I want to take that knowledge that I want to create and create an impact. Right? That's career appropriate for me. It would not be appropriate for me to do that right off the bat as an assistant professor, because I don't even know what I don't know yet. Right? But once I've acquired that, then I can start thinking. And I also need to make it consistent with what I need to do to be successful in the career that I have. 
right? One of the things that I often say, especially to business school faculty, that are trying to do everything at the same time, pace yourself, right? Focus on and also distinguish between objective functions and constraints. And get your constraints out of the way as quickly as you can. So if you want to do good research, in our profession at least, getting tenure is very important. Right? So getting tenure is not an objective function. It's a constraint. Once you have tenure, your objective function is doing the research that you want to do. Right? And all along, that's your objective function. But you, if you cannot get tenure along the way, then you're not going to be able to do or satisfy your objective to. Right? And that may be different for all of you in a different levels. Right? So it may be in terms of making sure that, for instance, medical students, you get a good residency right? so that you can become good doctors at the end. Agreed? So then you need to think about what's the objective function, what are your constraints, and separate the two. Okay. Often good to think about what is not in your frame of reference. So this is where I was saying to you earlier, I recommend to my PhD students and my junior colleagues, you can think about making impact later. You will. You're interested in it in the external community. right? But right now, your boundary condition should be making sure that the academic community regards you as a well-respected scholar. That's your first one. And then you can think about what you should not do, at least at this point in time. Again, I'm just giving you these as options. They're not like everything. It's like, you know, this is God's truth for each and every circumstance. I've had colleagues that make an impact right off the bat in a policy perspective, even as they're creating good and novel research. So then you want to identify also your points of difference. This is, again, going back to your strengths in your SWOT analysis. Notice that they all come together, too. Right? So your points of difference are your unique strengths. What is it that you do that you're most proud of? What would your colleagues say is your greatest strength? Right? Ask a lot of these questions. And then remember that SWOT and tools exercise for yourself. That's what's going to help you identify these. Then select only a few critical part, not everything. And then think through the feature benefit matrix that we just developed in terms of what's unique and how does it create value. And that's how you can then identify what is it that you want to focus on. Particularly when you're evaluating these points of difference, how desirable is it? How much value added will it give it to you? And then how feasible is it? Can you truly deliver within a particular time frame in terms of developing these capabilities too? When you're evaluating each point pod's desirability, the first question is, is it relevant to your audience? Right? I can be very unique on something, but if my audience doesn't care about it, then it's not something that's really adding value. And then does it distinguish me from other points of the people in my frame of reference? When you're looking at deliverability, do you truly provide this point of difference better than others? Or is it that you think you do? Right? And can you effectively communicate this point of difference? Because if you can't communicate it, then people are not going to necessarily realize that that's unique about you. And is it sustainable over time? Points of parity won't make you stand out unless you don't fulfill them. So my very you know, off-the-cuff response is personal hygiene. Right? If you stink, nobody wants to be around you. So that is an immediate point of parity right off the bat. Right? But of course, you can go much, much more serious than that, too. What are some essential things that you have to do that if you don't, then that is just not OK in your profession? You want to identify threshold values of point of parity and make sure that you deliver on those levels. But beyond that, it doesn't uh, pay or isn't necessarily good for you to focus on doing the best that you can. Now, why is it? 
that I say that you don't want to go beyond a threshold value with a point of parity. And by the way, someone's point of parity can be another person's point of difference. Right? So it's going to differ across each and every one of us and differ across time, points of time. Used to be that my points of difference was my ability to be excellent in empirical methodology. Right? Now it has become my point of parity in that I know enough about methods so that when I talk to my PhD students who are much, much better and have more cutting edge methods available to them, I can understand what's going on and I can challenge them on some of these issues. But my point of difference has become my ability to integrate theoretical concepts. Do, do you see? So something that's a point of parity bef difference before can become a point of parity later because you've honed on something else. Right? Why is it that you don't want to do everything to its highest level possible of excellence? A, you can't, goes back to that deliverability. But there's another more fundamental reason why you should not. Oh, I said burnout? Burnout, yeah. But I've got this concept, I'm an economist, right? Concept of opportunity cost and specialization. What do I mean by that? Yes? Partly it could be a waste of time, but it could also be that if each and every one of us is focused on only rectifying our weaknesses, then we don't have the time. We all look similar in the end, and the point is to stand out. But more than that, we end up becoming overly focused on what we're not good at, and then the cost is that we're not focusing on what we are good at. Right? So make sure that you are able to satisfy a threshold level at the point of parity, and then focus on your strengths. Right? So in performance reviews with my staff, my conversation is always about giving them very, very candid feedback. But the feedback is not, here are your weaknesses, and you have to fix it yourself. It is, here are some issues. You need to make sure that you're at least performing at this level. And now let's find someone else that can complement you so that you do what you're good at. And then they can do things that you either hate or are not good at. But they love and they're good at. Right? And that's where the trade concept becomes so important on a personal level too. Make sure that your weaknesses do not become your Achilles heel. Right? So make sure that you never ever go down below a level on any of these characteristics. That, and of course, ethical issues become very paramount out there. Right? You want to maintain high levels of ethics. That's, not, that's a given. Okay? So creating your personal brand is really finishing up this sentence again. To achieve my goal of, I will create value for, by offering this point of difference relative to my frame of reference in addition to the expected point of parity. Is that helpful? Okay. So careers in the future are very much nonlinear. Right? Sometimes you even have to go backwards before you can go forward. I gave up promotion and tenure at my first institution when I moved to my second institution. Right? That's huge. Started off as an assistant professor without tenure, coming back up because I had moved from economics into business. Right? So that in many ways would be a step back. But it wasn't in other ways because it was more challenging for me. It paid better too. Right? And it was something where I could see was more aligned with my aspirations. So a career should really be thought of as a portfolio of projects that's constantly teaching you new skills, giving you new expertise, allowing you to develop your capabilities, and reinventing you as a brand. Okay. So hopefully what you see from here is, in the last 50 minutes, what I've given you are some tools where you can benefit from creating a strategic initiatives matrix on yourself 
and you can create your personal brand. Now I have a few more tips and tools about leadership implementation, or I can take Q and A's and come back later. Q and A is better. Yes. Yes. So a couple of my uh, Forbes op-eds, I would recommend that you go read some of them. But the one in particular is, when being nice is not kind. What do I mean by when being nice is not kind? What's the difference between nice and kind? Being nice is sometimes not telling someone something that they need to hear. OK. Why is it that we don't want to tell people something that you believe they don't want to hear? Creates conflict, right? We, don't, we want to avoid conflict. I'd rather be saying, wow, great job. Look at how well you're doing, and genuinely mean it, as opposed to, uh, let's have this conversation, right? But more importantly, when I'm focused on being nice, I care about whether you like me. When I'm focused on being kind, it's about what do I believe is in your best interest. So the first order is seek out people who are kind, not nice. That's thing number one. But being kind does not mean that, you know, so of course it's honest feedback. But that doesn't mean that I sit down and say, hey, Kim, let me tell you all of the things that you suck at. Right? And then I'm only focused on all of the things that you're doing wrong, as opposed to making it a constructive conversation. Right? So never ever identify, both when you're giving feedback and when you're getting feedback. So when someone is starting to tell you, so first of all, it takes courage even to tell you that you're doing something wrong. Keep in mind that the other person's already uncomfortable. So if you want to get good, honest feedback, you need to make the other person more comfortable so that they're giving it. And they may, it's not that everybody has it right all the time, right? So it could be that someone's really frustrated with you because you didn't do something. And they come at you as saying, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't. Take a deep breath. Step back. And then have the other person step back too, very nicely, and say, OK, I hear that this is something that you're frustrated about. But can we just back up and you help me figure out how I can address this issue, right? Now that's focusing the other person to solving a problem as opposed to criticizing you and naming a problem. And it's much easier to criticize someone than it is to figure out constructively what a solution is. So identify. So first and foremost, do not shirk from people that are giving you candid feedback. Help them give you feedback that's actually constructive to you, if possible. Right? But definitely skirt away from toxic jerks, not helpful to you, and people that what, I, what Kim Scott calls people that are in the ruinous empathy mode. Right? Because what they care about is not necessarily giving you good feedback but just being very empathic and being liked by you. Right? You also want to stay away with, from people that have apathic indifference. Right? So people that you can trust do have your best interests at heart. Those are the ones you should be going for.